formal meeting. I'll meet you once more. I'll meet you once more on Wednesday or next week. <laughs> and uh, to start out the period, I have the last handout that I'll give you, and which was. <laughs> you, <know, laughs> well, you can make a problem out of it if you like. <laughs> but uh, remember, I was talking about about two periods ago the various various techniques that can be used for the uh, for the Charant method of distilling. So here, instead of writing it on the board, you asked me to put it on a piece piece of paper. So there they are. And. Um, I might just say a couple words about this, and then we'll move on quickly to another subject. <clears throat> um, um, Pardon? I guess not. <laughs> I guess not. I had intended to, but I didn't, didn't get to it. Well, first of all, uh, looking on the fr first page there, you see that... Um, uh, of course, uh, those drawings are just schematic, and and, and uh, they don't even look like the uh, onion-shaped pot, of course. But but anyway, in the first distillation, which is the French use the word chauffe de vin, the products are, if they're all taken, is a heads cut or a tet, and the low wines are brugge, and finally, if there is, is any taken, not always, a tails or a cue something like that. <laughs> then in the second distillation, which the French use the term bon chauffe, or good heating, the charge, of course, is primarily the low wines, or brouillé, from a first distillation, plus any recycled secondary products, which could include some of the seconds, or second. <clears throat> But then, in this case, there is always at least three products produced, a small heads cut, normally about 1% of the charge, which, again, they call tet. And, in, in effect, it doesn't make very much separation of, a, of a low, low boiling constituents like aldehyde, but in reality, it's just a, more or less a flushing of the lines out and get, getting it, uh, the water, and sometimes you get a white coating on the on the walls of the serpentine and the vapor pipe from the last distillation of, a, of, a, of wine, or the, the last runnings when you're distilling wine. And uh, when, if, when you first start running the, um, the brandy out, well, it, you, it'll be a turbid for, for a while till that's flushed out. I discovered this more or less by accident myself in my own practice. <clears throat> If when you start the distilling brouillé and, and the still has been previously used for an alcohol distillation, not a wine distillation, well, it'll run clear to start with. But if it's been used previously for a wine distillation, it'll run cloudy. Now, I might say that in the... <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's true of grape brandies and cognac practices. I might say that the same process is used with a somewhat larger stills and somewhat different shape in, in, the, in the highlands of Scotland for producing the all malt pot still whiskies. And uh, the, the process is very similar, and I, I don't go into any details of how they differ. But it is true that when they start distilling the, the low wines in this, what's the call, they call it the spirit still in the second still. In this case, they don't use the stills interchangeably. They have one they call a wash still and a spirit still. Whereas in cognac, they use them interchangeably. <clears throat> but in the, in the Scotch method, when they're really stilling the sp in the spirit still, the, the low wines, why it runs cloudy for quite a little while. And this is because there's so much, there's so many heavy oils coming over that uh, it, sh it shows turbid for a while. And in fact, in fact, they usually make the cut from the heads into the into the whiskey fraction when it starts to first run clear. So there's a, there's enough low boiling, I'm, I mean, uh, not, uh, probably high boiling materials that are weakly soluble that sort of steam distill in that first fraction to make it actually run turbid. 
So in other words, in, a, in, in the second distillation, you get these three products, a, a tet or a heads, mainly 1%. And then uh, as soon as that's separated, well, then you start collecting the brandy. And at the start of the heads, or at, that is, uh, at the start of the brandy, it'll, it, the strength will be around uh, uh, almost 80% alcohol by, by volume, <clears throat> at least 156 to 160 proof. And then it gradually declines. And the recommended cutoff point is about 60% alcohol, no lower than about 58, and that is called the heart or the or the cour, and it is the brandy, and uh, averages about 138 to 140 proof by U.S. measurement, 69 to 70 percent alcohol. Put in the barrels of that strength initially. <clears throat> then after that, after the cut is made, or they call it the coop, and uh, well, then they, of course they collect seconds, seconds. Now they may collect that all in one fraction, or they may cut it and divide it into two fractions. The, the, the first part of the seconds, or the higher alcohol portion, if that's, if that's uh, kept separate from the later running, then they, they, then they speak of this last part of the seconds as the tail of the seconds, or the cue de second. Then I won't, I won't go through these methods of operation except to mention that there are mentioned here three different methods as far as re recycling or handling these various fractions, particularly the tails and seconds. In the first method, the seconds are uh, recycled with the low wines or brouillé. But in this case, they, they make a, a tails cut from the first distillation or the wine charge, <coughs> depending upon the degree of wine in the pot so as to get a brouillé of about 28% alcohol, or 28 to 30 is desired then for the, for the second distillation, which includes the seconds that would be blended with it. In the second method of uh, distillation, page two, all the seconds, or seconds, are recycled with the wine charge in a, in a succeeding wine charge, first distillation. In this case, no tails or are collected from this first wine charge, and um, the entire first distillate is collected as brouillé, or low wines. <coughs> In this case, the alcohol degree of the brouillé varies according to the strength of the wine. Then there's some intermediate methods, and I sort of prefer the first intermediate method, where the first part of the seconds are recycled with the brouillé, the higher alcohol portion, and the last part, or the Q of seconds, is recycled with the wine. So, uh, merely mention these. I'm sure you won't remember all the details. That there are that there are some variations in technique that can be applied, and uh, some uh, feelings that some in some cases one gives you a little better result than another. But I don't <clears throat> won't go into that. Then a few general points here. Uh, the lambic is the name is, is the word is the word they use to describe the pot itself. It's con constructed of fairly heavy electrolytic grade copper, and it is onion shaped and heated by direct fire. As I've said before, formerly it was coal or even sometimes wood, but now with the compressed or liquefied gases. The capacity ranges from. Uh, uh, usually 10 to 25 hectoliters, although I have reports of some up to 100 hectoliters that are used for the first distillation now. But I don't think this is very common, and I think it's uh, um, I had some rumors it was permitted way out in the in the in the in the Boar Nair districts, and, uh, like the uh, clear out on the those two islands of Ray or Orleans, <clears throat> where this is, uh, those sizes were used or permitted. Generally speaking, 25 hectoliters is about the maximum presently used, at least for the bone chauffe, or the final second heat. So I guess I've mentioned here the desired strength of the brewery is about 28 to 30 degrees. Cognac is the heart of the second, second distillation, testing 69 to 7 degrees. GL or Gala Sac, the term used in France for indicating strength. 
and the coop or cut is the seconds is made at, at about six degrees out, no lower than 58. Well, are there any questions about that? <clears throat> uh, I, might, I might mention one or a couple other points here that that word chauffe de vin refers to the heating and the distillation of the wine, or the first of the two distillations. The word chauffe vin, chauffe hyphenated vin, it refers to the preheater that's used uh, and, and uh, the tank that holds the wine for a succeeding charge, sometimes also called réchauffe de vin. All right, now for the rest of the period, we have uh, two things that I want to do. One is we're asked to have a, this, an evaluation of each class, and so I guess... I got a few pictures uh, that show that large column down at Madeira and some of the associated um, equipment there. And then, I, then I'm going to just go through a slides we took in, in France in uh, April of 71 and April, May of 71. I didn't have time to sort them out. In fact, I only got them back to my colleagues a week ago. And so uh, I apologize for the fact that some of them will be kind of extraneous and, um, and uh, we'll go through those fast when they come to something that's significant. I'll maybe be a little, take a little time. Pardon? Local hot spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I'm sure we have more than we we'll have time to go through, but uh, I guess um, is everybody through now? We're ready to start. We're gonna hit the lights. All right, could somebody turn off the lights and turn on? Does anybody know how to run that projector? Oh, here's yeah. the back button. Just push the back button up to the top. Or maybe I can maybe I can talk back there just as well as up here. Oh, no. There you go. There you go. Oh, look at that. Uh, now. <coughs> oh, well, this is the office at the, um, at the Madeira plant of United Vintners, which used to be called Mission Bell, and they, uh, and they have the Mission <laughs> Bell uh, up in the tower here, and it's a rather nice little uh, setting. And, and, uh, <coughs> And, uh, this, this is the picture of this still we've referred to a few times in the class. <coughs> and uh, somebody um, twist that focus button just a little bit right there. Uh, that one there. I think it's a lot of focus. It looks like the there. there. <coughs> well, this is the column itself. This is stripping column. And you see it's a little larger <laughs> diameter. And I forgot now what that was. I think it was around uh, 10 feet. This is around 7 or 8 feet up here, the concentrating column. And um, here's this little aldehyde column, aldehyde stripping column, where they draw off the product up here somewhere, and then they run it down through this to strip off the aldehyde, and the vapor from that moves back in the upper part of this column. <clears throat> and this is the uh, this is that vacuum type preheater where they where they preheat the wine by pulling a vacuum with a with a jet you know jet siphon, pull vapor off the still engine that mixes directly with the wine. So you see that's a rather large tank. In fact, it's, uh, it looks like it's bigger than this aldehyde column. An and then this is the boiler. This is the boiler that they had to put in especially to pre produce steam from this particular still. In the background here is the distillery tower where they have two double column Krenz units, or in other words, a split column design, and uh, both of which have, uh, both of which 60 inches, I mean, uh, six feet in diameter. <clears throat> and this is the older powerhouse where the, where the steam boilers are located to supply the rest of the plant plus the distillery. <coughs> so then a few more pictures. Uh, this is a close-up of the boiler. The boiler, you see it's a kind of an integrated portable type boiler. And a lot of piping as you can see. <coughs> and uh, this is some of the tanks they use for storage and also fermentation. Uh, I had this been a fear for several years ago. I, uh, those, those look streaked because they foamed over. And uh, they use those for fermenting tanks. And uh, <coughs> this, this is a view from up the top of one of the buildings uh, looking down on the distillery. And also you see here, uh, this is a, a double effect evaporator, great concentrator. This little device here, and I have another picture that I think is a 
is a sand separator. I'll mention that when I come to it. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, right here. Here's the sand separator. You see they have so much uh, sand in the water, also sand in the, in the grapes, but most of it comes in the water used for washing and mixing. That when they run it through the still, it had a very uh, significant erosion effect or grinding effect and wear out the plates right in the tripping section, especially the feed tray. So by pumping the supply of water through a little tank here, with, which is where the water enters tangentially and then goes out the top, they were able to s separate a significant amount of sand and, I don't know, they got a, quite a pile of sand every day, I guess, whenever they dumped it. <clears throat> I forgot the details of this, but this is a two effects uh, evaporator and a concentrator where the, where the evaporator body, in this case, are round. And these are condensers here. But I, at this point, I forgot the details of it. Well, now, uh, now we begin this tour in France, and, uh, and, I, um, and the first one is a pers person we know in the office of Appalachian d'Origine in Paris, Appalachian Control. And she's making some appointments with us. This is Ted Kite of a guild who was my companion for the two weeks there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they were having a demonstration in Paris over, oh, it was a kind of a promoting the use of bicycles. So everybody was in, all, a lot of people came all around and uh, they stopped off the traffic to the main Champs Elysees. Champs Elysees and uh, had, a, had a demonstration, but it was all quite peaceful, no uh, violence that I could possibly. So uh, we took a lot of pictures and, uh, and I'll go right along here, <laughs> people looking. And after this, was, uh, then we went the next day. Uh, I, was, uh, I had quite a few here, didn't I? Well, uh oh. Oh, the police. There, the police, the police uh, finally came and, and cleared the way and pushed them back, but there was still no violence involved. Oh, but, but they did form a <laughs> phalanx and move them around. Uh, <clears throat> so the next day we started out the Champagne, and this is uh, you know, Bob <laughs> Ivey. He's the president of the Gill Wine Company, and uh, Mr. Kite is the vice president. <clears throat> and uh, we had an other one no good, so... Uh, well, um, well, these are a few views in Paris. This is the Pantheon. <laughs> this is the Pantheon over before we left. That's a boat on the River Seine. And uh, this is the gates to the, um, to the, um, the prefect of the police, I believe it is. <laughs> anyway, and uh, this is along the Seine. We just visited the Notre Dame, the cathedral. <coughs> This is the, uh, the obelisk at the Place de Concorde and the Eiffel Tower over there right here. We had a quick visit at the, at the um, 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 Louvre. And, uh, <laughs> see some of the paintings and little... That's pretty good. Some of the, you know, the modern art gallery, which is not part of the Louvre, but in the same grounds. That's, that's the name of it. <coughs> the Palm, the Jus de Palm, Impressionist School. Beautiful paintings. This is in the, the Louvre. <clears throat> that's a picture of the Venus de Milo. They, they can't use flash in there, but you're allowed to take pictures now. And so that's a thing of the Venus de Milo. Another view taken from the side. And a <clears throat> view looking up uptown from the from the grounds of the Louvre. <coughs> and uh, that's a restaurant where we had lunch on the way out to uh, to Ram Rims or Epirene rather and uh, our companions. And this is a view overlooking the Marne Valley. At, uh, we stopped to visit the Chateau Thierry, uh, Thierry uh, site of the World War II famous battles with Americans in the World War Cemetery Memorial there. But you can see the, you can see the town of Epirene, I think that is, uh, and the, the Marne down there. Well, this is part of the War Memorial. It's a, it's a World War I memorial. And well, I'll go on, and that's a statement of the, <laughs> on this memorial. <clears throat> and a, now, this is the entrance to Mutt and Chandon, which uh, some of us had a suggestion to remember of last night. And, and this is, here's the entrance to this. There's a statue to Dom Perignon, Perignon who was the uh, man which, uh, to which a lot of um, Are those the two lore is attributed. Pardon? Are those two champagnes the same? 
They're made by the same company. Well, Don Perignon is a, is a brand name or a special name used by Moet and Chandon. Oh, is that a better champagne than Moet and Chandon? Then? Well, I think uh, I think it generally reserves for some bucks. special selection. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the best that they have. They, 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 when they put Dome bearing on, I think it's the best. <laughs> well, anyway, we got in there rather late on Sunday afternoon, but we got an opportunity to visit the place. Uh, we didn't have an appointment, and uh, used some of the people here. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, they have this. This firm has a wow. has a beautiful chateau, which is a part of the part of the property, and and the very VIP guests get to stay in this, which is part of. Has had something to do with what's this for me? Royally, no, I think it's, it's a, a trap. It's a duck it's a very beautiful place. Nice. view of it, <coughs> flowers. And uh, I had to go take a picture of the building here in the city where I, which was our military headquarters, our battalion headquarters that I was in in World War II. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's really, looks like it flies down and cafe. And this is in the office of the of the. And, uh, what they call CIVC, the uh, Committee Interprofessional for the Van Wines of Champagne, and uh, we were having our first. Um, <laughs> we had a, we had a, drunks. <laughs> we had a nice uh, <clears throat> dinner here and in in champagne, and um, then then uh, I didn't take any pictures in that particular mutton chandal. This is a picture in R R Ram the next day of the. Um, have uh, a little in the, in the firm of true of, of, uh, of uh, Lancer, the Lancer, <clears throat> and uh, I showed a little bit of the distribution. And then uh, here is some of the equipment I took of where they have a pretty modern cellar, it doesn't screw up very well, but some of the pump controls and central <coughs> panel here. Uh, this didn't show up the tanks for these are modern, either glass lined or stainless steel tanks. Oh. <laughs> this is Mr. Um, what, uh, I'm not saying that quite right. Lan Lancer. Yeah. Lancer Champagne. Yeah. Well, he's the president of the firm, or uh, general manager of the firm, and we were walking down the street after having lunch, and he saw this girl, he says, grabbed her the arm and says, turn around, we'll take a picture. So <laughs> that's what that was. <laughs> Now this is another Girl view in another boys. champagne firm uh, that, where they where they moved from uh, the, from the city of Ai up to the suburb of Rims and produce and built a completely new plant with all the underground cellars and caves dug out. Well, this is a man, the general manager, and this this lady is a publicity uh, uh, representative and hostess, and so. So there's some pictures here and there, fairly modern fellows. Then we drove on down to, to the southern part of the district and stopped and looked at a vineyard. And, and it might be interesting to see it. I think you can see how, they, how these vines are always trained one way. I don't know what the name of the, of the vine it is. But that's a general view of champagne. There's a close up of how they train the vine. That's really There's some name to it, but I don't know that much about it. <clears throat> Some more views. Now this is. Now this is in a. Uh, this is in a plant down in the Côte de Blanc region where they uh, have a. I think it's still a kind of experimental, but they're trying to use some sort of a mechanical riddling also. You know, Corbels here in California use mechanical riddling, and that's what this was for. And that was one of the control pumps, that the air control panels for this equipment. <coughs> It's a little dark, but you see some of how modern and, and elegant some of these places look. <coughs> this is their storage tanks for wine. What district is yeah, this? This was in the what they call <laughs> Union de Champagne, or it's a, where they make only a white wine. This is a this refrigeration unit for chilling. Gasquet is the firm, you see. And, uh, so you see, it's all very modern and, and very attractive. Uh, let's see. This is on the railway station. We, came back to Paris and we took a train down to the Cognac district. So this is a, after we got to Angoulême, which is a city on the east side of the Cognac. And uh, a couple of views there while we were waiting. We got there just about 12 and everything's closed up so we had to wait around until <coughs> we get a rent another car. 
Park. So this is some of the city hall, part of the city hall of the hotel. Um, and then this is in a public market. We went in there. It's kind of interesting. They just sort of closed it up. <clears throat> then that afternoon, we went out to visit a, a firm who, who constructs stills. And this is out uh, in our Olympics. And, the vicinity of Cognac, and this is a, out in the courtyard where these are probably oh, these are probably old units of being reconditioned. But these are the serpentines used in the uh, in the condenser, you see. And I think, and then these are some of the old pots that they've brought in on trade ends, you see, where they built bigger ones, and they're sitting out in the courtyard here. And I, I don't think my pictures inside showed up very well, uh, and uh, maybe they failed, and so I don't. They had some beautiful, they were making some beautiful new pots there, and, uh, and, uh, Then they went out to visit a, a distillery, and this is uh, some of the things out in front. You see tank trucks for hauling wines, or a distillery, and that doesn't show up because it's too dark, but but you can see, but you barely you can see a pot here, and then a shoe fan here, and a, well, here's another pot. And then the fan and the store. I think I well, that was not very good either. <clears throat> I got some better ones. But you see, these are uh, these are these are made for using <coughs> gas. So these are the gas controls, and uh, well, they're all uh, done up with a nice stainless steel front and very pretty. It's actually the the firm that produces Polignac. And apparently it's going to be imported by this company. That's it, there, Prince Hubert Pol Polignac. And the guild is apparently in plan to bring it in now as, an, as the as the agents for dis distributing it in the United States. It's pretty good. It's produced by uh, a cooperative, but the cooperative is very large and very modern. And now these are there's some more of their <coughs> some more of their equipment that shows up a little better. Still too dark. To see how meticulous everything looks, shiny and... Uh, how old is this place? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a better picture what I want to show. Well, I don't know how, though, the company is fairly old, but some of these installations here are probably within the last year or two. Oh. And you see how modern and pretty that is here. This is the way most all the new pot stills would look. You see, they're almost always put together as a, as a, in pairs. Now here's another picture, but I think these are older ones that have been converted to gas. I don't recall, but anyway, you can see the. These look like fairly large, don't they? Pot here, and uh, very curious. If, uh, <coughs> I don't see any shoe fat for this one. But there's one here, and there's one over there. But anyway, that's what they are. Mm -hmm. That's the second one. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. I, I got one. I got. We got. Yeah, we got time. I'll put another. Uh, yeah. Just after noon. Nice. Where are you going? Yeah. This afternoon, about Yeah, I got some. Well, I kind of forgot where this was, but obviously it's um. I'll be there this evening. Tanks. Uh, um, wooden tanks. I guess it's um. Cognac storage. I forgot which plant that is. Maybe the next picture will, will remind me of it. That's what it was. Oh. <coughs> well, anyway, this picture here is taken from up the top of the Hennessy Company <coughs> and overlooking the, um, the the river. What's the name of the river? Um, hmm? Hmm? I can't even think of the name of the river now. Uh, huh? Sorry. Well, anyway, maybe I'll come to the minute. No, it's not the Loire. It's a river that runs through uh, through Cognac, and it's um, hmm. can't think of it. <coughs> but anyway, uh, that's a look at this. This is kind of looking now. Uh, one view across the city of Cognac, and uh, and uh, <coughs> and just looking now a little closer. And some of these properties are part of the Hennessy, and you notice the ones here that have significant amount of Cognac in it have and probably used for aging have uh, black roofs. Originally, they were red tile like this, but they turned black because uh, there's a type of mold that some of you know about, I forgot the name of it, that grows on alcohol. And uh, and so the roofs of, uh, if you drive around the countryside, you can pick out those that got cognac stored in the buildings because of black roofs. 
pretty good diet. It's the same sort of a mold or moss that grows in, in the cellar than in, like in Burgundy, where they're very proud of this moss that grows. And they, and they have a certain amount of, uh, of a lure about uh, using up, um, um, giving off oxygen and, and keeping the cellars in proper uh, atmosphere. But anyway, well, this is up on the <coughs> top of this, and this is Mr. James Hennessy here, who's, I guess, I don't know, I guess he has the title of president of the firm. He's also a physicist and works half time in Paris. <laughs> Well, there's another view from the, top of, from the top of the building. Now, these are rather poor, too dark in here. <clears throat> but, uh, <clears throat> but this is in their bottling room, or their, uh, and, and you can see there's a lot of little wooden tanks along here. There's probably a uh, hundred or more of those. A little. And those are the ones which they, from which they bottle during grades, and they have a whole lot of them. And this is sort of their control panel that they... It looks a little complicated to me, but they have a lot of, uh, all, they have a lot of combination of alternate ways of these various lines and diverting them to connecting different tanks. So that's that's their control panel for their bottling room. Now this is a this is in the Grand Champagne, the little village of Sagenzac, south of Cognac, where the Hennessy had a distillery and a little and, a, and some vineyards. And this is in a. I think it's sort of a pilot vineyard or experimental vineyard that they use in cooperation with the experiment station. But this is this is in late uh, late uh, April, so there's no evidence of, uh, of, of growing. And uh, this is again out in the vineyard, and this man here has something to do with the experimental pruning test they have. This is Mr. Hennessy again. <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, this is in the firm of the Hine and Company, and um, for this is Mr. Ive in the middle, but this is Mr. Robert Hine, the senior brother, still in charge, still in active in the firm. This is his son. There's another brother who's retired, and he has another son about this boy's age that uh, operates the firm. Very kind people. They took us to dinner that night. I thought I had a picture of that, but I don't. Now, this is, <clears throat> looks across the river from the Hine firm to the a firm called Tifon, which is a Swedish firm, but they produce cognac, for, but only for export to Sweden, as far as I understand. Well, this is the dinner that night with some people from <laughs> from England, but this, and uh, we were having a lot of fun, of course. <laughs> the firm of Hein has now been purchased by the Distillers Company Limited, or the DCL, so three of these people were people that didn't know a thing about cognac, but they come around to inspect and inspect uh, and get entertained in the cognac uh, uh, because they're part of the firm. Uh, they, 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 oh, that was, that was that night before we went to bed. We had a, they decided they wanted to have a taste of the cognac, so we had some. The next morning in the hotel breakfast. <laughs> then we went to the Courvoisier firm, and so this is inside the warehouse where we see the barrels and uh, this particular man here is the uh, was in charge of publicity with our guide and showing us around. But you see how here they're put on racks. Oh, these are bar bigger than American barrels. Those are 350 liters or another nearly 100 gallons. <clears throat> and there's a picture in, in there. They don't bring the barrels down and dump them all like we do. They simply empty them and fill them in place. That's what they said. Then these are the tanks here that hold 350 hectares or 100 barrels. They're old tanks, and um, they have they have a, a whole lot of buildings. And these are new ones that they still in the process of installing. They haven't even got them shined up and varnished yet. You see, they got to keep putting new of these in there. Pardon? They've got to keep putting new barrels in there. Well, I don't know how long. That, it all depends on how long they expand and how long they, how long it goes. Well, a lot of these barrels and these tanks were produced by the <clears throat> by uh, the firm of uh, Marshiv and Fruenholtz of Tonellery, or uh, that's a cookery's house, make cookery's. Oh, well, apparently they got another name here on the gate. So we went to see that. So there's a few pictures here of the stocks of wood out in the yard, out in the yard here of this Tonellery, and uh, here's the splits. The split uh, whole portions that will eventually become the barrel staves. Now here drying, and uh, these are some that have been now planed down to um, 
see they're pretty thick. But um, uh, so, and uh, here's some of the here's some of the Lena's eye logs. You see they aren't too big, but they cut them here in lengths and then they bring them into this. In, in this case, they bring them in here to this plant before they're been before they've been split. The older practice was to split them out in the forest and stack them up and let them dry three to five years out in the forest. But here they have them, and of course these sticks down here would be used for the longer and the higher tanks, like the 350 hectoliter tanks. Uh, it didn't work. And, uh, <clears throat> well, I don't know, he's ripping here or something. The pieces, another view of the stalks. And uh, here's a Here's a, here's a tank in the process of being assembled inside the plant. <clears throat> this is Mr. Uh, Marshy, the, the owner of the plant, <laughs> the owner of this. What and, uh, kind of wood is that? Oak? That's all, it's all oak and it's all um, mostly uh, Limousin oak. Maybe all Limousin, I don't know. Maybe they have the, the Troncé too. This is a lot of focus, I think, but it's in the process of forming a barrel. Here they have the stage put together and held together by three hoops at the top, but the bottom is still is still not pulled up. And then there's a little fire in here. It's almost like charring it, but they put a little fire in to take to temper the wood. So it, when it when it's bent, it will not have put as much strain in the wood. Sometimes inside the barrels they look slightly toasted. There's one company here in uh, California that bought some tanks from this firm. And uh, they claimed that uh, they were uh, they gave off flavors because they're charred on the inside. Well, maybe they had a little bit of a tint to it, but I rather doubt that was a very serious defect. So here's assembling barrels, <coughs> casks in the plant. And more another view of the handwork involved and in putting the casks together. Uh, this I think out of focus was a stack of barrels that inside this plant to be shipped. Forgot where the oh that's in there that's in their company offices this paying window. <laughs> that too. I don't know what yeah, that, uh, I, this appears to be in in Bordeaux at the uh, down in Bordeaux. I thought I had some more pictures between there, but in Bordeaux they have a large building right in the center of town called the Maison de Vin or the House of Wine, which they have various functions including tasting. This they were not doing a tasting then, but here's a bar where they have samples of wines from the various districts and somewhat like our wine advisory board they put on they just the labels are not commercial labels but are district labels. Well there's some views I think taken in the firm of a uh, of a cordier, some of the wine storage tanks. These would be steel with with the, the maggot lining or the kind of baked on enamel. Notice up here they have a little a vapor connection where they maintain a certain atmosphere of uh, nitrogen, I think it is, to keep the, uh, keep the air out. And uh, <clears throat> this is a big centrifuge that they use mm -hmm. in, their, in, their, in their central cellars where they produce the, more or less the common wines or the non-classified wines. This is one of the control panels that they, where they uh, <clears throat> use to control pumps. This is a view of their building, or one of their buildings in downtown Bordeaux that's on what they call K to something, or in other words, this corresponds to the Embarcadero, so right over here is the river. So they, these, this is, these are all called K or something, Q-A-I. And uh, then we went out to visit uh, two of their important chateaus, the two best known chateaus, the two are Chateau Gruel La Rose and Chateau Talbot, both classified <coughs> gross of the Madoc. So here they had a little tasting for us at the Chateau Talbot. I mean, uh, Chateau Gruel Rose. And um, here's a few pictures I took inside the building. These are, you see how these are little um, dull light, so it looks more yellow than it is. But see some of the casts that they have in Chateau Gruel Rose. These are some tanks here, probably made out of cement, but I'm sure they're glass lined, lined with glass plates. But anyway, that one thing that's impressive about this is how meticulous they are and, or, and, and schematic. And this is their... They're fermenting in them. <coughs> well, I don't know. I, it's rather curious. Gas traps? It looks like they've almost <laughs> deliberately painted the center there between the oaks with, uh, with wine stain to make them all look alike. <laughs> but anyway, this would, be the 19, this would be the previous vintage, which was uh, 1971. Because here these barrels are... 
are now stored with these temporary bungs, which is a little made out of glass. I don't know whether I got a picture of the, uh, I guess I didn't take a picture. Down the, in the level below, they have the wines that are of the, of the year older vintage, and uh, they finished doing the racking. In that case, they drive a bung in hot and tight and turn it a little bit on the side. From then on, it'll never be opened until it's taken out the bottle. Well, this is the, when the view of the Chateau de <coughs> La Rose. Uh, the front would be out on the other side here. Uh, and these are some um, some tanks, some new tanks. to see how nice and neat they are. And, uh, <coughs> then we went to Chateau Talbot for lunch, and this we're going in again, sort of the the back entrance, but uh, yeah. which probably everybody uses. They don't use a big, elegant gates out in front. So uh, <clears throat> this is Chateau Talbot, and uh, going in again, going in. Oh, this is a, this is an old chateau, and is the <clears throat> and whenever the president of the company, Mr. Cordier, is in residence in Bordeaux, this is his home. He spends most of his time in an apartment in Paris, I was told. <clears throat> but uh, it was an old but a rather elegant place. And after a lengthy lunch, they had this grass, I mean, an ivy-colored tower out here. And some one of the members challenged some of the others that they could climb that tower in so many seconds and up they started. So I got a whole sequence of pictures here showing how people <laughs> behave after a lengthy lunch of about six or eight lines. <laughs> so they all went up. Oh, up there, it's kind of dangerous, as a matter of fact. There's Bob Ivey even climbing up there, and uh, another yeah, one, and now, that, now they're <laughs> coming. <laughs> <laughs> this is the general manager of the firm. <laughs> <laughs> he obviously he has a good time. <laughs> Mr. Boutrille is his name. I had met him 20 years before, and uh, 18 years before in Bordeaux, and uh, when he was a, sort of the publicity manager, but he, now he's the general manager. Very nice man. Here's Mr. Ivy, just starting to come down. <laughs> so, and when I got down, this this prankster here took away the bottom ladder. So. <laughs> <laughs> here they're coming down. And <laughs> How many people do you have <laughs> Signed it, and finally somebody put the ladder back up, and they <clears throat> completed it. Completed it. Just a, <clears throat> some pictures taken of Chateau Kirwan. That's uh, another classified growth from Madoff. And uh, this is Mr. Sheeler, sort of the senior man of the firm. He, I think he's retired and his son is the general manager. And a little tank here. <clears throat> Here's our, this is Chateau Kirwan. We were going in to have a little glass of wine in the, in the drawing room after we'd had some out there out in the shade of the plant. And so uh, this is, this is <clears throat> Madame Sheila. This other lady was, was sort of a guide that was going around with us. It's quite knowledgeable about, about an American by birth, but married to a Frenchman and tends to go around with the visitors if, if, if those would like to have her. This is the front view of Chateau Bechevel, very famous um, classified growth and one of the pretty ones, although the picture on a dull day is not as attractive as it might have been. Well, this is the tower at Chateau Latour. Now there's only a small insignificant chateau there as far as the building is concerned, but this is a tower. They're doing some uh, restoration work on the tower. <clears throat> so this is part of the vineyards of Chateau Latour. Actually the in Actually, behind it, and this, uh, these trees there, and uh, right along the road is the Chateau uh, Pichon Longueville. It's a neighbor. <clears throat> so we had a very nice lunch at Chateau Latour, and uh, these, these are the fermenting tanks. So they were the first. They were the first one of the first firms in Bordeaux to put in stainless steel fermenting tanks. It was partly, probably, the influence of. Professor Berg here, who then was a, a kind of a consultant part-time to Harvey's, and Harvey's of Bristol had an interest in this, and uh, so they were one of the first ones that went to stainless steel tanks. This is looking out the window of one of their reception rooms, and uh, uh, the reason I took that, this, this <coughs> little line here is the demarcation line between uh, um, let's see, what is Latour? Saint Julien? Or, um, what is that? What is it that you remember? 
San Just Julian and um, yeah. one of these is San Julian and the other one is um, San is death, I guess, yeah. And so this is the border line here. <clears throat> and uh, they had, interestingly, they had a they have a second chateau whose name I can't remember that they used for a secondary label, and that's across the road, and that's what that's where we are here. But it's been built up rather modern, and I can't remember the unfortunately what his name. This man here is Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Martin or Martin, who is sort of the, he owns a couple of chateaus, smaller ones like Chateau Gloria, but he's also uh, sort of the winemaker of Chateau Latour, very knowledgeable. He's also president of the syndicate divine of Bordeaux. <clears throat> and here we are, here we are getting some samples poured in a little uh, coopsive of, uh, of Pouillac. Pouillac is the word I was trying to think of. And, um, uh, that's the district where the tour is located. <clears throat> and here's a little place here where it's rather small, but a lot of little growers produce or bring their wine here, this cooperative. And it was kind of interesting, uh, this old man here was very appreciative, and these two old men were part of the firm. And it was rather poor, and the wines were not too good compared to the usual Bordeaux, but, but uh, <clears throat> we bought some wines anyway. Well, our time's running short. We we took a trip with some friends of ours on a Sunday. We didn't have a chance to visit particular chateaus, but out to the Saint Emilion district, <clears throat> across to the east. And this is the, the ruins of an old monastery, which was important in the pil pilgrimage that was made to the shrine of Saint James in northwestern Spain. And I, I don't try to get into that because I don't know very much about it. But <clears throat> but, but anyway, uh, long and. Um, Western France, there was many of the stopover points for the pilgrims in making this journey to this shrine. So some of the <coughs> pictures I took there, I just uh, move on. It's been <coughs> the buildings are in the ruins now, as you see. <coughs> you see a lot of these if you look around France. This still is a church, so it's still in, in, in uh, still um, in operation. Well, we're having lunch at this famous. Uh, Hotel Plaisance, Hotel Ple uh, Pleasure in the <laughs> in the Saint Emilion, yeah. but that is, it's a very good restaurant. <clears throat> and uh, this uh, this is a view looking out over the old village of Saint Emilion, or Saint Emilion, which is very old, Great and uh, <clears throat> medieval. Some of the some of the vineyards right up against the town. I don't know for sure which those are, but some of them like Chateau Son and so on are very close to the city. Actually, our friend there, Professor Mrs. Carter, he, who, was, uh, who at that time was the director of the uh, University at Bordeaux, the uh, University of California, uh, late at Bordeaux, <coughs> but now he's back here at Davis. And then, so I we'll go on here. Another, another view off the there, and then uh, here's, a, well, that's the uh, place where we had those lunch. <coughs> Picture the old, uh, the, tower of the church and, the, and this church is a hewn entirely out of stone the bottom part of it we went into that and uh, we went then we took a little drive this is the entrance to uh, hotel cheval blanc mr kite was sure there'd be somebody there but there wasn't anybody that answered the door but this is the front of chateau cheval blanc <clears throat> and this is a, this is looking to the north some of the vineyards from Chateau Cheval Blanc, and they're on the right on the bordering Pomerol. So right here would be the Pomerol district. <clears throat> and uh, I can't remember, I can't read these signs, but uh, this is Pomerol. And, uh, Cheval Blanc. That's Cheval Blanc. So that's a <clears throat> part of their vineyard. This is outside of Chateau Petrus, the most famous of the of the of the chateaus of the Pomerol. And uh, some vines right around the chateau, <coughs> and uh, same thing. I did visit that place once in um, in 1954, <coughs> and this is this is down in the district of Barsac, where the white wines are made. And uh, we were met by this man, Mr. Leo, and this is his daughter, and he was a no, that's not his name, is Mr. David. He's a proprietor of Chateau Leo, a producer of Barsac Sauternes. <coughs> but this is a kind of a syndicate here in the center of the little town. And this is a view of the Chateau, um, I can't think of it now. Very famous Barsac Sauternes, uh, Chateau um, 
Kute, Chateau Kute. This is a part of the cellar of the Chateau Kute. The Chateau building is on the other side. <coughs> we tasted some very nice wines in here. And these are some of the barrels of the new, new stocks. And uh, this is a lot of focus, but <coughs> they use some very primitive methods here. And uh, um, use, uh, use basket presses to move around on these tracks. And uh, but this, this inter if I had time, I could discuss this. That they, what they usually use, you know, rub the rub the grapes, press them by hand <clears throat> without having a mechanical crusher. And this is the Mater D there, drawing a sample of the start turn of the, the, the bar sack, and uh, a picture of the group of us taken out in the office here. <clears throat> And some of the uh, people again, and uh, uh, those are some of the, yeah. the old vines uh, here at the vineyard and, and the village in the background is uh, Barsac. <clears throat> and uh, this is a little view of this, of this part of the chateau grounds. Uh, rather pretty, I thought. <clears throat> One thing about France, though, they don't usually mow the lawns. In uh, many places, they let the lawns Sweet. grow kind of natural. <clears throat> Well, this is a better view of the village of Barsac looking across the vineyard here. <clears throat> this is rather unclassified, but rather nice little chateau that owned by Mr. David called Chateau Leo. And he, uh, even though we didn't know him before, they kindly took us there and we spent the day with him at a magnificent lunch. And, uh, and this was his family. <laughs> and so, uh, and, um, and, and they spent quite a bit of money in, in, in improving and modernizing the, the chateau. It is their home, of course. <coughs> and, uh, some pictures here. Then we, then we stopped to visit Chateau Climat, the uh, second most, uh, or uh, one of the two most best known, along with Coute of the Barsac. But again, we didn't get to visit it. We did visit, however, another one. Well, this is still Chateau Climat. And uh, here's the entrance to Chateau Caillou. Not so well known in this country, spelled C A I L L O U. And uh, it, it was a, this is, a, I didn't show <clears throat> some, of the, some of the shipping uh, areas where, the, where they have bottles, relatively small but very nicely and kept. This is a, this was the proprietor of the Chateau Caillou. Uh, his name escapes me now, but he had a very nice old um, Chateau Caillou. Well, these are some friends that were the uh, that lady was our guide. Then the final day, we uh, I think I have to show here, we went out to visit Chateau Haubriand, right out in the outskirts of Bordeaux, and this is a man here drawing a sample out of the cask. I don't suppose they like them. He's just showing the fact they had a little mold growing down here on the bottom of this time barrel. <coughs> but this is in Chateau. And we, we tasted the, I don't know, a couple. We had tasted one out of the bottle of 62 and, and the Obion of 71 or 7, 71, or I guess it was, or 70. And this is the outside in one view of Chateau Aubryon. I think our time's up. If anybody has to go, you want to go. <laughs> I'll just run through quickly. It's another view of Chateau Aubryon. More shadow over on the name. Uh, they're doing some constructing work here. So you see the name. Some of the <coughs> some of the vineyards. You notice the gravelly soil. And um, another another secondary building. It's a more modern, but it's about a quarter of a mile away from the main building. Still called Shadow Aubryon. This is in downtown Bordeaux. And this policeman turned out to be a, quite a character. So we, <laughs> he, he was a, one of the most interesting person, gesturing the way he apparently knew everybody, and he was. A, so he saw us, to be interested. He motioned to come over there, and so that Kite went over there, and, and uh, we took his picture, and then he let Kite to put on his hat. You know, <laughs> what's well, happening in the street? Well, 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 well. <laughs> this is at the uh, University of Bordeaux, the um, <clears throat> where the. Um, Station, uh, Enological Station is located. In the new campus, and this is Professor Pascal oh. Rivio Gaon in his yeah. office, who's been here at Davis several oh, times, and maybe some of you met him before. And uh, in the office, and this is uh, I think this is I think this is the building where their where their office is located. I always get them all mixed up. 
And uh, maybe that's the last. I think we better stop at that point anyway. <clears throat> well, 